we will welcome on stage. Goodbye, Laurent. We will welcome on stage my good friend, Ken Lane. Hello. Hello, Mr. Lane. How are you doing? I'm good. Long time no see. Yeah, I'm, long time no see. Yeah, too long time. I'm embarrassed. My beard is not any longer than yours. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, can you share your screen so we can uh, start your presentation? I'm really looking forward to the states of your API specification toolbox. I'm sure like everyone. Can you see my toolbox now? Yes, you are seeing your screen. Uh, maybe you can hide the little toolbar at the bottom by clicking hide, not stop sharing, but hide. And uh, if you are set, the stage is yours. We are listening to you. Excellent. Thank you, Arno. I appreciate it. Let me zoom a little bit because for us older people, uh, it helps with the eyes. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm very pleased to be back at API Days. Um, I've been doing them for seven years now, eight years, something like that. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm sorry we couldn't be in person. Uh, I miss being in Paris. Uh, but thank you for, for joining me today. My name is Ken Lane. I'm uh, API evangelist, and I'm chief evangelist for Postman. And I'm going to talk, uh, share stories, uh, walk you through what I consider the, the modern API specification toolbox. So these specifications are all in use today. I think you've, you've already heard uh, from several uh, of these today. Uh, but let's uh, let's take a look at what how people are using specifications to to define their APIs, uh, starting with Open API, uh, which is used to describe HTTP uh, APIs, Async API, which is used to describe most everything else, uh, and then JSON Schema is the the modeling language used to to bind them them together. So Open API and Async API both use JSON schema to describe the objects that are, are passed back and forth uh, for all of these APIs. And then there are Postman collections, which can be used to uh, describe uh, APIs much like uh, OpenAPI does, but more for using it in, in specific stops along the API lifecycle and trying to actually uh, make them available for documentation, mocking, and other purposes. Um, and then lastly, APIs.json, also known as APIs.yaml, uh, is, is a format for describing uh, the surface area of your API operations. So it's not describing your APIs like OpenAPI and JSON or Async API. Uh, it's describing uh, the operations around them. And let's, you know, to help understand, let's walk through it. For the, the purposes of this walkthrough, um, we're going to walk through the Slack API because it provides the best example of a, a multi-protocol API out there that everyone knows. And if you want to walk along with me or maybe after the talk, you're welcome to go to um, API Evangelist slash talks slash API specifications walkthrough. Um, I also tweeted it out at API Evangelist on Twitter. So you can follow the link there if you would like. So I'm guessing the fonts are a little bit small for you to read, but um, I'm going to narrate it and kind of walk you through. But this is why it's meant to be an interactive walkthrough so you can go through on your own and actually see each of the specifications in action. So let's start with OpenAPI. Slack has an OpenAPI specification for their, their web API that uh, it's hosted on GitHub, and everyone can use it to make sense of, of the Slack API. The open API provides a information block, which is just a, a small block of information, title, description, some contact information, but more importantly, what version you're actually working with of the API. So this is actually using version three of the open API specification, but this is version 1.5 of the Slack API. And this versioning is how we manage change. So Slack uh, has provided us with that, that version in the information block, helping us make sense of what this API is all about. Next, there's a server block. So this is where you can put in uh, the paths for uh, 
where you'll actually access the API. So in this case, we have the API path as well as the OAuth path to be able to authenticate uh, with Slack servers. Then here's a, here's a basic path. Um, there's many paths described in this API, but this provides you with uh, an, an overview of each of the paths that are available as part of the web API. Each path contains an HTTP method that's used, post, get, put, delete. Uh, Slack uses mostly post for, for, for the majority of their APIs and makes it available uh, in this open API document. Each path also contains a summary, providing a really short, concise information about what is possible. And then a more robust description about what is, uh, what's, what you can expect from this individual API method when actually integrating and putting to use. Then OpenAPI allows you to describe parameters. In this case, we have a header parameter, but you can also describe query and path parameters, providing details of uh, name and description for that parameter, and then uh, schema information that helps you understand what type of information is contained, helping users understand how to uh, properly make a call and get the desired results. If it is a post or a put, there's a request body um, that describes as uh, the, the media type, the content type that that's, can be expected, and then uh, links to the schema and providing details on, on what can be expected when, when the information is, is submitted. Provides details on responses. Um, every status code, there can be multiple types of status codes for each uh, type of response. This is a 200 status code with a content type of application JSON. And then for each, uh, each response, you can provide a schema and an example. When you have a schema reference, uh, all it is doing is referencing in another location in the open API document. We have a pound sign that's in this document. Components is the components uh, object for this open API. And then you'll find a list of schema, including the conversations archive schema that we need uh, for this particular API method response. Here down in the components library, this is the reference that we were referencing above. Um, it shows the full details of the object that it, you can expect back as part of a response providing just some details on the objects, but also the properties, the actual individual properties that are returned, uh, providing details on each uh, property, the type of data, and then if possible examples and references to other uh, objects that are returned as sub resources for this, uh, this object. So providing all the schema you need to understand what will be returned. Um, but this is the JSON schema portion that I talked about. This is actually a JSON schema object uh, embedded in the open API, providing you with the details of, the, uh, of what you can expect back for each response. So all of this, this open API contract, it can be used for many different purposes, but oftentimes most people consider, think about it for documentation. Um, as MyCroc showed, excuse me, as MyCroc showed, it can be used for mock servers, it can be used for testing, SDK generation, and much, much more. Um, most developers think of open API as documentation. Uh, formerly known, open API is formerly known as Swagger. So that is the version two or the, the outdated version of the specification. Um, but Swagger UI, which is uh, interactive documentation, is one of the uh, benefits that a lot of people think about when it comes to putting it to uh, the specification to work. So documentation tends to be the, the face of the API lifecycle, but open APIs can be used uh, throughout the API lifecycle for many different purposes. But more importantly, it is uh, the central truth of what is available, what is possible by uh, an API, and uh, provides a human and a machine readable definition of what uh, is possible with an API, providing that, that central truth and contract 
that can be shared and used, providing a common vocabulary uh, that anyone can put to work. Next, we have the async API specification. So the Slack, Slack has a separate uh, events API, which is a WebSockets API for messaging. And they have published a, an async API alongside their open API in their GitHub repo. And to walk through a little bit of, of async API um, and, and what it provides, it's a, it's a sister specification to open API. It was uh, uh, de designed in my keeping open API in mind using a lot of the same properties. So one of the first properties that you have is an information block. Again, providing us with a title and description of what this API does, provides us with contact information. Um, and again, the versioning. Um, there's also a terms of service available here as part of this, providing us with that general information that we're gonna need to know for any API that is being described with async API. Again, we have a server block, but it's a little more robust. We have full description, we have URLs, and then we have a set of variables that support each URL, uh, allowing us to pass in variables that describe the URL and other, other parts of the path and, and the URI. So uh, providing a rich set of information, including the protocol, because this is um, async API allows us to describe multiple protocols. Um, and WebSocket uses HTTP uh, as, a, as a header, a bridge to TCP, allow, letting us know that we can then make that switch and, and, and connect uh, to the real-time API. Now where it starts diverging from the similarities to uh, open API is we have the ability to describe channels. These are the channels that, that can be subscribed to and published to. Um, you know, depending on the system you're using, you're going to call these topics, you know, um, but channels allow, give us a way of describing the different namespaces uh, in a pub, pub sub model that allows us to describe the surface area of our API. So think of channels as, as paths in an in a, in a HTTP API, but these are, are the different channels that you can uh, publish and stay subscribed to when you're uh, working with a real-time API. Again, each of these channels, we have a, a summary that provides us with a, a pretty concise overview of what can be expected from this channel. And then it provides us with a, a set of tags that we can use to describe uh, each, each channel and provide a, you know overview of the resources that are being a, a, a made available via these channels. And then we have a, a reference again to the payloads again, Reusing patterns from uh, OpenAPI, we have a, a components object, which where we can put all of our schema, and we have in this case a generic event wrapper uh, schema that we are using for the payload of this of this channel, and we have our reference to it in the document, and here's our full object. So we can, uh, it's again, this is the JSON schema portion of the conversation. So this allows us to describe our objects using a common specification, JSON schema, and then reference it as part of the payload for these uh, subscriptions, uh, these channel subscriptions and, and, and publishing. So it gives us the ability to describe our objects. We've got our description, we've got our different properties, and then we've got schema and examples and, uh, and other details for each of these properties helping us understand what can be published and what can be subscribed to each of these uh, uh, APIs. So again, async API provides a contract that most notably, most visibly is used for documentation. But as Microc showed, you can use it for mock servers, you can use it for testing, SDK generation, much, much more. And the tooling around async API is still growing and expanding. Um, uh, it's it's not, uh, I would say, you know, Open API Swagger started in 2010 and 11. Async started in 2016 and 2017, and uh, we've got a lot of tooling uh, to be made. But I would say again, the um, the most visible part of it is the documentation. 
So this is the quickest and most tangible benefit from using async API, but it's it's just the most meaningful and tangible. It's it's that API contract can be used throughout the API lifecycle for a lot of uh, additional purposes. So there's um, JSON schema documents. You know, I can even though I have JSON schema in the open API and I have JSON schema in the async API, I can have these uh, JSON schema files separate all by themselves so that I can use them in, for other purposes other than just as part of the open API or the async API. So there's JSON schema for the Slack events API, which you will find in the open API, but ideally they're standalone JSON schema objects that could just be referenced from that open API. And then, uh, oh, actually I did them in reverse. So that was the, that, that one I just did was for the, the async API. This is for the web API. So this is the JSON schema in the open API, but it works the same as we could have a library of just JSON schema objects across the events API, the event driven API, as well as the web API. And then these could just be referenced wherever they're used in those open API and async API contracts. But for me, this really gets at the, the critical nature of JSON schema in, in, in being a cornerstone of both open API and async API and providing us with, with the vocabulary we need to, to model our objects. So these JSON schemas used for validation. You know, this is how you validate the, the, the request bodies, the response uh bot payloads the 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 messages that are published to uh and subscribed to as as part of different channels so those payloads can be validated and that's what json schema excels at now uh, there's there's push to to make json schema also help us describe the underlying objects so that we can generate databases um they'll they'll need to be more work before we can go there but just validation alone has really kind of pushed JSON schema into the forefront of enterprise organizations because uh, it's 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 robust in helping us get done what we need to do. And just to kind of go up and blow your mind at a meta layer um, and, the, and the important role of not just JSON schema when it comes to our individual API implementations, there's a JSON schema for the open API specification. So the, the open API itself has a JSON schema, and this is how you, you can use to validate different parts of your open API specification as valid. Similar for JSON for async API, there is a JSON schema for the entire API, async API specification, allowing us to validate uh, that our, our specifications are correct. And then to really go uber uber, there's a JSON schema for the JSON schema. So just to show you that the power of validation and the importance of validation, this is how, how we're validating our documents and our contracts. And they're, it's a cornerstone to all of the specifications. Additionally, moving on beyond open API, async and JSON schema, there's Postman collections. Many folks use Postman collections in similar ways to how you use open API for describing the surface area of, of HTTP 1.1 APIs. But Postman um, uses uh, open APIs and collections together. You can actually generate collections from open APIs. But Postman collections, while, while able to describe most of the surface area of an API, allows you to go one step further than open API can. So open API tends to be the truth, the contract for your API. And the Postman collection allows you to derive a version of that truth, but then apply it in a specific uh, scenario, business use case, or workflow. So you can take that open API, generate a collection, and then populate specific query parameters with certain values that is difficult to do in open API. You can set defaults in open API, but Postman allows you to actually uh, populate different values um, as part of those query or path or header parameters. And then you can apply variables, which can be applied using envir Postman environments. So you can actually have variables as, as those values 
and lay in depending on on where you're running this collection whether you're running it for mocks for docs for contract testing integration testing it allows you to apply those variables and then the one piece that it has that you will not find in open api is the ability to embed scripts pre-request and post request scripts that allow you to automate orchestrate test and certify different aspects of how your apis work actually running uh this this executable unit of of an api um, and actually making sure we're, we're meeting our contract obligations. And then to wrap up, all of this is, is uh, can be indexed using what's called APIs JSON. APIs JSON is a format that was created in 2014 by Threescale and API Evangelist. And it's meant to not describe your APIs, but to describe your API operations. So an API's JSON provides an index of your of the of this one in particular of the overall Slack API operations. So details of, of where you can find the portal, um, an overview of the API. But more importantly, I'm indexing all of the artifacts that I just walked you through above. It indexes the Postman collection for the uh, web API. It, it indexes the open API spec for the web API. It indexes the async API for the events API. And, but it also more importantly provides a whole host of other common URLs for the parts of the Slack API. Um, so the blog, it has a branding page, it has embeddable buttons, it has a change log. So providing a whole host of, of human readable links as well as those machine readable ones that I talked about. If you need to find their security page, um, so it provides all of this, an index of all of the, the Slack operations in a single uh, call. So hopefully this walks you through some of the, you know, how the API specifications work individually, but more importantly, I think how they all work together, because that really is the part that's going to get us into the future is realizing that a diverse API toolbox is the future. And yes, HTTP 1.1 APIs or REST APIs aren't going anywhere. Um, they are the cornerstone and kind of the starting ground for most people, uh, API providers, but async API, JSON schema, Postman collections, and being able to index and discover our APIs is pretty critical. So hopefully that gives you a kind of a view of the picture in the context of the Slack API, but this can be used to describe uh, the entire landscape for, uh, pretty, uh, for any enterprise organization. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me on Twitter at API Evangelist. Um, you can find a link to this specification toolbox and you can walk go through the walkthrough on your own. Um, sadly, it won't have my voice associated with it, but hopefully uh, it, it does give you an insight into how it all works. Feel free to hit me with any questions. And with that said, I will hand it back to uh, Arno. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, everyone was very happy with what you have just shown and especially the tool. And uh, you could have stayed a few minutes longer if you wanted. We have three minutes for question, especially with one um, from George Jeff Cook. How to shift the notion of API specs from documentation, but to be the single source of truth, product design thinking, and so on. This is a question that anyone have to answer one day. Uh, so if Ken doesn't work, come back, I can answer that question. Uh, it's a long and hard work to make people change their state of mind. Yes, yeah, Ken is back. What, what's, like your feeling, what's your feeling about that? Um, ask the question again. Sorry, I was trying yeah, to get back. So it's about shifting from API spec, which is just like to do documentation and switch to uh, the single source of proof, the product and design thinking. Yeah, well, you hopefully your tooling is going to help you in this. So hopefully your tooling is going to help you realize that, um, you know, open API is more than just a config file for your documentation. So if you're using Postman, if you're using Stoplight, if you're using uh, tools that are going to help you uh, do other things, generate codes, uh, you know, tools like 42 Crunch that are going to scan and actually show your uh, secure your APIs. So hopefully your tooling is helping reveal these other values, these other stops along the API lifecycle. 
And ideally, they're keeping the, the contract at the open API at the center of that discussion. They're not just abstracting and hiding it away. They're bringing it front and center and showing you how if you craft your open API in a in a in a in a, in a in meaningful way, that it's not it's going to be more than just docs. So if you put examples in in for each API, your docs are going to be richer, but your mock servers are also going to be more possible and richer. So hopefully our tools are doing this. But I would say, uh, folks like you and and me and others uh, educating people about. What is the difference between Swagger and Open API? Why you should be using Open API? Um, I, I think education is is and training and upskilling folks within our organizations is is the next important piece. Yeah, that's that was a very good question, very good answer. Definitely, the more and more you use the Open API specification for different things, the more it will become de facto the source of truth. And Fran Mendes is trolling. Why open API and not sugar free? Thank you, friend. Uh, it's the end of this session, the end of the day. Uh, it was a pleasure to see you, Ken, and to see Fran and everyone today. Uh, I hope that everyone was happy with the different sessions. Thank you very much to all. Thank you very Thank much. You. Hope I to hope see you again too. soon in, in person, my friend. Yes, yes, we need to have a drink together. <laughs> Thank Goodbye, you. Goodbye, Ken. Goodbye, everyone.